Welcome to On My Way to Wealth, the podcast where busy Gen Xers can learn financial tips as they navigate life on their way to wealth. And now, please join your host, Luis Rosa. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of On My Way to Wealth. My name is Luis Rosa, and I'm your host. Today, I have a very special guest, a dear friend of mine, live and direct from Ciudad, Mexico. <laughs> Her name is Diana Giselle Yanez. She's a certified financial planner and is the founder of All the Colors, a financial empowerment firm dedicated to helping clients create peace and joy with their money so that they can find, they can affect their community and the world. As a money coach, meditator, and activist, Diana brings a unique approach to money questions. You can sign up for her bi-weekly newsletter, bi-monthly newsletter, which I'll give you the link for in the show notes. You can also find it at allthecolors.net for inspirational posts on money and community and to hear about upcoming workshops. Welcome, Diana. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry to interrupt your, your stay in, in beautiful Mexico. Tell, tell me a little bit about that. What are you doing over there? I'm actually, I mean, I'm going to be living and working from, from Ciudad de Mexico and Oaxaca and Puebla for the next summer, for the next three months. That's amazing. Yeah, but that's me. Yeah, with us being virtual, I mean, it just it's something I've been wanting to do for a long time, and I'm I'm really happy. It's so I love traveling, and this is one of the best ways to do it. That's amazing. I talk about living your, you know, like walking the walk, right? You like you work with clients to help them achieve their goals, and you're like, hey, I want to live in Mexico, so I'm just I'm gonna go for it. <laughs> That's I think awesome. It's such a big part of it. Because I mean, if I'm telling clients to go for their dreams or to do the thing that they're afraid of and then I don't do it, you know, like it's just yeah, walking the walk. Yeah, that's very true. Uh well, I'm very glad that you're in a position to do so. I mean, this is one of the a lot of the positive things that have come out of the pandemic, you know, obviously it's been something that's affected negatively a lot of people, but there are also some things that you've been able to take advantage of, like working virtually and being able to do things like that. So I'm glad that you're able to be following and doing your dream. So congratulations to that. So tell us a little bit about your background and your upbringing, where you're from and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so I'm, and my family's not from Ciudad de Mexico. We're from Baja California, Sonora, which is on the border with the U.S. And that actually colors my money story a lot. The fact that I'm the first one in my family to be born in the U.S. as opposed to Mexico, I've always been very aware of what, like all of the opportunities that I have, you know, and always just also kind of confused about it because I didn't do anything different. And I have all these, all of these additional opportunities. And that's kind of what brought me back to, to Mexico too, to Ciudad de Mexico for the summer. And I grew up, um, both of my parents immigrated here. They worked and they did like the, the, all of the jobs that you do just to get by. And for me, like learning about money, I remember they had a little small store. And when um, when Walmart came to town, it actually changed our store a lot because a lot of the jobs were gone. A lot of like, it was a lot more cheap. It was cheaper to work there or to buy their things there. And for me, it was like, well, I want to figure out a way where I'm not in that situation. How do I make sure that, I'm all, that my money is always taken care of? And in college, I studied business, I studied economics. I thought about getting into this business, but I was also, I wanted to give back to my community. So I did like a whole 180 and went into social work, right? So I did social work. I did other key things along that, those, those lines, but I always kept coming back to money work because I always thought the questions there were so interesting of like, how do you live well and use your money well and like affect your community and the world? Like that's, that's what really inspires me to, to do this work with all the colors and with clients yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, one of the things you touched on was that your parents did all the jobs to get by, right? And and sometimes a lot of those jobs don't come with a 401k or or stock options or anything, right? You just, you get a salary, <laughs> hourly rate maybe. And and uh, if you're lucky, maybe some health benefits. Um, I, I don't even ever recall my parents having medical benefits in their jobs. It was always jobs like that just to get by factories there was no 401k no no health benefits so uh you know unfortunately we saw them work hard and the most that we learned about money was kind of like try to save as much as you can right 
but but none of the stuff that you would encounter as a first generation being born here, right? Like, um, did you feel like you learned about things that you wish you would have known when you started, like with your first job, like employee benefits and things like that, either in school or at home? I was talking with a friend of, of mine about this. She's also first generation. She's first generation Chinese. And she and I met at a program in college that was teaching mostly first generation kids how to do corporate America. Oh, wow. You know, and yeah, we were really lucky. And that's, and like, that's where we learned about benefits. That's where we learned about how to, how to show up at a corporate office. And that's amazing. I remember, um, yeah, I remember in college when I was taking my business classes, learning about Roth IRAs. Mm-hmm. And thinking like, I should set one up. And my parents, my, my dad is still like, neither of them save for retirement. They they have a house in Mexico. They're going to go live there for retirement. Like that's kind of their plan. And I remember my mom once being like, I have you and your brother. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're their insurance plan, their retirement plan, long-term care. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> that's I funny. I looked at her like, what? <laughs> You're like, what do you think I work this hard for? You're, you're my retirement plan. <laughs> Your middle name is 401k. I never told you that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, that's very interesting because as you are telling us about your story, uh, I see a lot of similarities with me being born in the Dominican Republic. My parents also still own a home in the Dominican Republic and the house that I was uh, born and raised in. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of like that's the mentality. Eventually, just go back home, right? And and you have your house and that's it. And just like, there's really not a, a huge retirement plan like like we do as financial planners with our clients, right? We take into account all these different uh, factors right, about the future, right? Inflation and this and that. This is more simple. Like, no, I'm just going back home, you know, to, to my house <laughs> that I have, you know? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty cool though when you think about it too, because it takes a lot of complexities out too. You know, like it's it's such a, a simpler planning process because um a lot of it is, is just rooted in in that emotional thing that they have. Like, you know, my parents raised us there, they they've they got married while they lived there, they saw all their kids grow up in that house, you know, and it's just like a simple thing for them to just feel like we just want to go back home, right? You know, so they travel back and forth. Um but all the kids are here in the U.S., so I know that that has kind of stopped them from fully just saying, "All right, we're just leaving," you know. But they still go there every single year, a couple of times, and they're not letting it go, <laughs> without well, a doubt. That's actually wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome that they still have the same home and they can go back to it. And and I mean, right now living in Ciudad de México, it's so cheap. It's so much more affordable. Yeah, right? absolutely. Absolutely. So you you could really live uh, much better over there in terms of, you know, the cost of living for sure, especially if you already have your houses paid off and you just need like just your living expenses for sure. So thank you for sharing that about your upbringing. And you mentioned how that like shaped your money story, right? So do you have any uh, siblings as well or you're the only child? No, I have a younger brother. He's three years younger than I am. And really like I have my my earliest money memory. So that's one of the things about financial planners, especially when you look at like financial life planners, we're always asking about what shaped your money story. And my earliest money memory is definitely around um, being, I was with my cousins and he went to this little tiendita, this little corner store, like Navarro, um, I guess it would call them a bodega in New York. Mm-hmm. And when we were at the cat, I was like eight or nine years old, and we went up to the cashier to pay, and I was I was the only one with money. Even though there were like five of us, and we were buying candy or whatever it was, chips, and my older cousin was like, "Well, you pay because you have money." And <laughs> I was eight; I was not that generous, <laughs> and I don't remember if I paid or not. But I remember being really kind of like confused about it. It's like, why do I have money and you don't have money? Right. And why do I have to pay for it? And like, that's, that's so Latino too, of like, if you have it, you actually have to give it. There is no, there's nothing that's mine. Everything is ours. Yeah. That is so true. And uh, especially that hits home for me. Like when, when we happen to visit back home, like we go back to the Dominican Republic. Yeah. Like you want to share that whatever, you know, doesn't mean you're super wealthy, but whatever it is, like you, you want to treat somebody to a meal you know, it's very common for us to, uh, a lot of us that are first generation, 
who still have some sort of connection back home. You know, sometimes it could be family members, you know, just to send money back home. Or even if it's not consistent, there's always something that happens. They're very common. Like my mother would call me occasionally and be like, hey, you know, cousin so-and-so is, you know, is a little ill. Like, you know, you know, it's kind of like GoFundMe, like with no websites, you know, it's all, <laughs> all word of mouth, you know. So there's always that, that connection of helping others, right? So I like that. It's like community too, for sure. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. And, you know, speaking of that, then um, how do you define wealth? Because I know, you know, in, in our field, we see a lot of titles like that, like, oh, wealth managers, you know, and a lot of the times I feel like people look at wealth differently, right? It's it's not necessarily all about a large sum of money per se, or not all about money by itself, right? So I'm curious to to know, like, how do you define wealth? I mean, personally, I define wealth as like having flexibility, having freedom, enjoying the work that I do. You know, that's the benefit of having like of having been born in the U.S. and having the education that I have and the career that I have is that I get to decide a lot of what I work for. Right. Whereas my parents didn't have the choice. They were just like, there's a job. I need a job, you know. So that's how I define my wealth, like my freedom, being able to being connected to my community you know, being able to spend time with friends and family and knowing that I'm being of service to the world. Like I see so many things that need to be worked on. And I just, I want to make sure that I'm adding my little grain of sand into the right, into the pile that I think is moving us forward. Right. And do you find it, um, do you do a a work with like peers of yours that kind of went through the same situation as you where they may be first generation as well? Well, that friend I was talking about, my friend, um, Belinda, she's Chinese American. We were working um, a couple of weeks ago about how does she define wealth? How does her family define wealth? Right. And the expectations in her culture are different than the expectations in mine. But what I help clients come to is their own definition of wealth. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Because I think if, if we, as certified financial planner professionals, you know, we can't just stick to the what we learn in the curriculum, right? All the textbook stuff, because there are some cultural aspects to consider, you know. And you, n- not everything's going to apply to people the same way, you know. the The textbook answer is not always the right answer, right? So I love like the work you do where you go deeper than just like, okay, show me your income and your assets, and let's do a net worth statement, and then like here, put money in the four. Okay, it's more like, no, tell me about your money story. And what that means for you, what what does wealth mean for you? What kind of impact you want to have, right? So that that's really good work. I mean, I think we need a lot more of that in the financial planning industry because a lot of it sometimes is just based on managing money itself, right? And not necessarily like people's true desires, right? And it's, it just doesn't motivate people. Like the numbers do not motivate you to do anything, to change anything. Like, I think of how, um, we know how food is so easy, right? Eat more fruits and vegetables, stay away from sugar, exercise more often. <laughs> well, we all have the answers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That's basically it. And with money, it's like, save for retirement. Make sure that, I mean, spend less than you earn. Make sure your housing <laughs> is like 30% of your, and it, it just doesn't, it doesn't, it's not related to reality. Right. If the guideline is your housing needs to be 30 percent of your income and you live in New York, like that, that's different than if you live in Philadelphia. <laughs> I, I cringe sometimes when I see those like, you know, those. Oh, yeah, this is like the formula right here. It's like you can't put people in a box, you know. <laughs> yeah. So when you're working with clients, because you mentioned life planning, right, which I love that. Um, how do you interject like the the importance of having like specific goal into the overall conversation? Well, let me tell you about my process. I'm actually going through the registered life planning uh, training right now through the George Kinder Institute. Nice. And yeah, I, I'm really, I'm learning a lot from it. It's, it's such a different way to do financial planning. Um, it's, a, it's a really good addition. So when I, on my first meeting with clients, I asked them like, what's, everything that's happening, right? Like what are all the the reasons that brought you here? And a lot of the times it's money reasons or there's like, there's some big transition. Either they have a new job that's paying them more 
or they're, they just realize that they're actually not going to be able to pay off their student loans in the 10 years that they thought, like there's something that happened that brought them to me. So we'll spend the first half hour, 45 minutes just with them telling me about it. And the main question that the train, the kinder training teaches you to ask is anything else. And when you tell, when you tell a client that anything (laughs) else, they have a lot of things (laughs) to unpack, right? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. And especially um, like if you can sense that me as the planner, I have the time for them, right? And that I want to hear them, people will relax and just share more. So that's one part of it. And then I do a values exercise. This is a values exercise from Bill Backrack. I think that's how you say his last name. And yeah, it's like, what's important to you about money? And then you say whatever it is. It's freedom, it's security, it's whatever. What's important to you about having security? Right. And you keep doing that until you find out what the the most important values are. And that just creates kind of like um, it just creates a really good goal for me. So that when I'm talking or whenever we start talking about the actual numbers and they start to get a little bit overwhelmed or I can sense that I'm losing them or that they're. And that's that's often why people will come to me specifically, because I'm so like gentle and it's all that meditation. Right. (laughs) So when I start kind of like put put, like pulling away, I'll remind them of their values. I'll remind them of something else that they talked about in their goal. So I just always try to remember, have like their best vision of themselves in my mind so that we can keep coming back to that and like keep them energized. And then it's also, I mean, just like with food, just like with exercise, this stuff can take time. Yeah, I really like that approach because I feel like sometimes, you know, and obviously I've been guilty of this myself as a financial planner. We are very quick to, we can be very quick to just put on the financial planner hat and immediately they just start formulating like solutions for the client. And and there's a time to just pause, listen, ask open-ended questions. And I like what you do where you go several layers deep so that you get to the the true Meaning of, uh, and I feel like sometimes clients didn't even realize until they're having that conversation with you, right? <laughs> Which is amazing. They don't even so. know. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And I think, and I sense that in myself all the time. I always want to go to the technical. I mean, not always, but like I sense that impulse of wanting to go to the technical answer of seeing like, oh, you should just do this. <laughs> right. I think one of the examples is one of our clients was having um, like cash flow wise, things were tight. And they were real for them, tithing was really important, you know, and giving away that 10% to their church. And my colleague said, well, maybe we should mention this. I'm like, I don't think we can. Like, unless the client brings it up, there is no way that I'm going to jeopardize their relationship by getting in the way of their values. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, the, the, and that's so key what you're saying right there, because there are so many non-negotiables. I have clients that are like that. Yes, they 10% tithing, no matter what, you know, and, and it doesn't matter. I mean, they would forgo, you know, 401k contribution if it meant, right? You know, um, and that's what I was talking about. Like the textbook doesn't always apply. You know, you, you have to take their values into consideration and and work with within that value system, right? And uh, yeah, it, which is the, the great work that gets to come out of the life planning process, which is amazing. Um, you know, and speaking of that, like, cause you said like, there's, there's some things like that, like the tithing, for example. So tell me about the power of saying no, you know, how do you, um, work with clients in that regard? Cause I know you had mentioned in one of the conversations you had before that, you know, when you say no to some things and you means you're saying yes to something else and vice versa. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So I have a, one of my clients, um, like she, she just has a tendency to spend quickly, right? She doesn't even think about it. She's just like, oh, I spent it. I don't know. Oh, I have a credit card. And I was talking with her about like, once we did that values exercise, we had a clear vision on what she wanted to bring about in her life, you know? And it was like, was traveling the way that I'm traveling was providing for her daughters. And whenever I was reminding her, like, whenever you say yes to this impulse purchase, you're saying no to that other thing. And it's not good or bad, right? It's just, making sure that it's a decision as opposed to just automatic. Mm, I love that. I love that because you're, you're, you're being non-judgmental. It's like, look, it's not good or bad, but, but it's a conscious choice. 
Yeah. And I, that's what I try. That's really what I want clients to walk away from. Like when they were, they, if they, whenever they're working with me, I wanted to walk away having a little bit more clarity around what they're doing with their money. Right. So when you say no to an impulse buy, you're saying yes to this longer term purchase. But when you say no to think, for example, if there's like not a lot of work-life balance in your job, or you're not happy with your job and continuing with that, it's like, you're saying no to the job that you would like to have or the career that you would like to have. Right. And that's where my clients having like peace today and like having feeling, having joy with their money, then they'll be, and that's my favorite type of client, the client that's kind of aligned with my own values of wanting to be an idealist and like help the community, help the world. Then you have more freedom to do that. Because if I'm worried about how am I going to make ends meet, or if I'm so exhausted that I can't even like make time for my family, then I can't, I can't be of service to my community, you know? So it's, there's, there's a way where you can be really clear and intentional about what you're saying yes to. That makes a lot of sense. And and I love how you also focus on the non-money aspects like quality of life. You know, you mentioned having a job that doesn't provide you for work-life balance. You know, I feel like there are a lot of people in that situation where they're doing something just for the money, but they really are unhappy. They don't have time for themselves or their families. And, you know, I've had conversations with clients like that where where they've actually taken a lower paying job as a result. And it was a conscious decision because they're like, well, what good is money if I'm going to be dead soon? Because they were so stressed at work, you know, and uh, the pandemic was one of the reasons why a lot of people were able to realize that, you know, maybe there's a different way, right? Um, and gave them a lot of time to think. Some people have chosen to even pursue entirely different careers as a result, you know? Um, and I think that's one of the great things that we're able to help clients with is kind of align their values and and then see what their goals are and then do action items based on that. And I like what you said about just having that intention. Um, and then speaking of which, do you find that sometimes like uh, how important is it to be like very firm on your goal, but flexible on the path? Is that something that you kind of help clients navigate as well? Yeah. And, and actually I want to go back to the earlier, we were talking about like what you say yes to what you say no to. I remember I was in LA I was in the on the four hundred five, and like we were just not moving, right? Because oh yeah, four hundred five, just get there, <laughs> the giant parking lot. And I looked to my, I looked to my left, and there was this beat up old car, super beat up. It was the car was like I'm not sure how it was moving still. And the guy on his dashboard had a deadline, had like a timeline of when he beat that free. Really? Yes. Wow, And it was just his constant motivation, right? He was saying no to a new car because he was saying yes to being debt free. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> it was, it was, I, was, I was in college at the time. And I just remember being really like impressed by that. Um, what he decided that he valued and taking the, the chances to get there. And so coming to your question of like the, the how, the what is important, the how isn't. So for this person... It was important for him to be debt-free, whatever his reasons were. I mean, he was in a different car. I didn't get to ask him any questions. <laughs> but how do people decide to get there, right? So if I could see, I'm thinking of my 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 friend Belinda with her, her what is making sure that she's, that she's able to provide for her family as needed and that she also um, respects the company that she works for, right? That the company, like when, after all of the like racial protests that happened last year. She just wanted to make really sure that wherever she worked, they actually had really, um, they really embraced diversity and inclusion, right? It wasn't just like window dressing. It was a PR stunt, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It wasn't just a PR stunt. I like that. So how does, how was she balancing those things, right? Being able to provide her family making sure that she, she would respect the company she worked for. And that what, that really clear vision made it possible for her to see like, well, what she was looking at companies to apply for as she was changing jobs, it was easy to just cross off the ones that weren't the right one, right? So then the how of the company was, yeah, just having that really clear vision is so helpful. 
Yeah, you know, that's another great point. I because it ties into the yes and no thing. I feel like if you if you know your why, it's like that guy. I mean, I really uh love that. I mean, seeing like his his own personal bed clock <laughs> on the dashboard. It's like I know the the North Star. This is the why. This is what what I'm going after. So the decisions that I need to make on a daily basis are e- not that they're easy, but they're more, there's more clarity in, in making them because you know, well, you either sinking or you swimming, right? So it's, uh, there's only so, so long that you can like tread water for, right? So it's like, all right, so this came up, you know, do I then say yes to this? Because if I do, then I, I'm making a conscious choice to delay me getting out of debt as a result, because I'm going after the instant gratification of an impulse purchase, for example, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, How do you, find that it is it is there a process that you recommend to kind of finding that clarity is it is it that that um bill backrack for example like those conversations like are those like the really helpful um exercises to do to find for yourself like if somebody's out there they really just don't know exactly what they want to do uh what are some ways that you would recommend that they kind of start off to maybe find some clarity in their lives? Yes, definitely that build back rack exercise of like, what is important about this? And you can find, he's got like YouTube videos where you can see him do it with different clients. That could be really helpful. I think it's also, I mean, it's remembering like, what did you love doing as a kid? And are you doing it now? And I think we all have it inside of us. Like if you're quiet enough, like whatever it is for you, if you go take a walk on your own, if you're having a conversation with someone you really like value and respect, like, and you're, you're looking at it, you're, it'll come up, you know, it's, it's just like making the time to listen to it. And sometimes what's hard is when you hear what it is that you want to do, what, what your why is, and you're like, oh, that's a lot of, (laughs) (laughs) That's a lot. It, it can be a lot of work. And yet I find, at least for myself, um, not following my why, not not really bringing about the what that I want to bring is also a lot of work because I constantly have to like squash down a side of myself. Okay. Wow. And that must not be easy. <laughs> no, no, it's because it's Again, so thinking of my my friend who was looking at firms that really were not just doing the PR stunt around diversity, mm-hmm. the firm where she was at before they were doing the PR stunt. And it's it's just really hard to live in that. Wow, yeah. That's a tough decision because, you know, the, the job in and of itself might have been well-paying, good benefits, whatever, and then you got to be like, but still, it doesn't align with my purpose. That's bold, Yeah. And that's what all the colors is about for me. It's making sure that we expand access to financial planning. And it's beyond, I think there's a lot of really wonderful financial literacy information out there, financial education. But I've found that unless you actually have the, like the mental bandwidth, the mental space to look at your values around money, to do more of the inner work around money, all of the education in the world isn't going to sink in. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So it's hard. It's really hard to say no to that impulse cry or to, for example, um, if you have a family member that's like, that is always needing your support. And at some point you're like, I actually am not helping this family member by helping them with money. This family member needs to like, you know, like have a little bit more of tough love. Mm-hmm. Having that pause, having that kind of little, um, and you can do it on your own, but it's also really helpful to have, to do it with a, I don't know, with a financial planner, with a financial coach, with a friend of just like taking a step back and thinking, where am I really going? Yeah, I think it's great having uh, both the accountability partner and also an unbiased perspective as well. Because a lot of the times you might make a decision just based on emotion and somebody like a financial planner or financial coach can help you separate the two, you know, and make a decision that's based on the value system, right? And not what you're feeling in the moment. So very important for sure. So yeah. and one thing I wanted to add about that, there's this, there's this book I read recently called Scarcity and why having so little means so much. I don't remember the name of the authors. And they did research on how, how people get kind of stuck in the debt trap 
or even in the time trap, you know, like if you have a job that's demanding a lot of your time, like what people end up doing is they just focus on today. What do I need to get done today to make sure that the house is still floating? Mm -hmm. A lot of the times that's when payday loans come in and you'll take a payday loan that'll take pay from next week, but at least you got the bills covered today. At least you got something to eat. Yeah. And it just becomes into a really bad cycle. Like those payday loans can have such really, really high interest rates. Extremely. Extremely. Yeah. I remember I saw one, I was driving by and it was like, they were advertising 7%, but it was like 7% a month or something. It was like a ridiculous amount, you know, (laughs) that when you, when you add it up, it ends up being like, you know, almost, you could end up almost paying double depending on how long you hold it for. Right. And it's uh yeah, it's a trap. It's, it's um, like it snowballs in the opposite direction. It can get easily away from you. And, you know, I could relate to what you're saying about thinking about the now, because a lot of people are kind of like, you know, like you mentioned in that survival mode was like, what do I need to do just today and to get through the day, put food on the table, whatever, and keep the lights on and I, I'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow. Right. And a lot of that comes from to uh, depending on the person's background, you know, me uh, growing up in the Dominican Republic, I saw that a lot. Like survival was a main thing on an everyday life. And I mean, I remember people, it was very common for people to borrow money. Uh, I remember they had this system. Uh, we call it uh, a sang, just S A N. I've seen some people call it a susu. Um, I don't know. Yeah, so it's like the, it's like peer to peer lending kind of thing. Uh, so you just got together with a group of people. You you pick the number, and you know. So if you were all gonna do a hundred dollars a week for ten weeks, it's a thousand dollars. So if I'm number one, I get my thousand right now, but I still need to contribute a hundred for the next nine weeks. You know, and and I remember that. It, it, like that was one of the my early memories of money, people doing those kinds of things. Also, when people did have a little money, it was very common to just uh, like put it in the bank and uh, they call it freezing it. Apparently, I guess it was something similar to some sort of CD where it was like the money's locked. So it was kind of like uh, on one end, you were doing something to get money right away. And on another end, you were doing something to put the money like a separation between you and the money so that you didn't have access to it and it was getting some interest, right? So it was very interesting. And then in between, I mean, like pawn shops were very common in my neighborhood when I was growing up. I remember people would pawn anything. I mean, even like your your iron, you know, your iron appliances, people needed money and they would just like bring it to the pawn shop and and anything. I mean, I remember people pawning like, like, pants, like a suit, (laughs) you know, jewelry. It was just doing whatever they needed to do to just get through that day, solve whatever problem needed to be solved that day. And, and I find that sometimes that mentality then comes along. Like you mentioned, you had the, you were fortunate, right. To be born here and have opportunities that were not available necessarily back home. And I saw that as well, where in my case, uh, we did get jobs that had benefits and stuff where my parents didn't. Right. And I feel like sometimes people have that struggle to make that transition if they come in from that background or where they still keep the live for today mentality. And I've seen that even with clients in the past, I have gotten significant raises over time, you know, because they were going through school at first, maybe not making a lot of money. And then eventually they graduate, get a good paying salary. And, you know, they just let their, their they find a way to spend all the money that is coming in, like regardless of income level, you know, so they may be making a hundred thousand more than they made before. And they still live in paycheck to paycheck because they're just driving nicer cars <laughs> and, and, you know, just spending that much more, you know, so it's hard to make that transition sometimes. Uh, and I think that's one of the great work uh, that you do because you, you come up with their value system, you know, you let them tell you, right. Their value system, and they might be uncovering it as they speak with you. And then you can say, well, now if you make this decision, it's going to take you away from this North Star that we talked about, right? And, and now you're making a conscious choice, you know? So I really love that. I think that could be very powerful in making that switch for sure. And going, going back to that scarcity book that I was talking about earlier and everything you said is right on point about like, you just need to make today work, right? So the way that they found people could get out of that loop was setting up systems 
making things more automatic like that. Um, that, that Lusu, we call it a ronda growing up. So I also, I saw it. My grandmother was in charge of it. She was the most like trustworthy one with money. <laughs> but those kind of things, they, they like make it automatic. So now you don't even think about it. You're going to put away that hundred dollars. And then when your payout comes, you already know what that money's for. Um, so that was one thing systems. And the other part, they actually said it was having an accountability person or having a time that you would step away and look at the bigger picture. Because otherwise you're just, you're so exhausted. You're just making the day-to-day work. Um, and like, and I think it's just remembering like the situation that my family, that I came from, from my family growing up and like what you're describing about people pawning their shoe, like their, their pants. <laughs> it's hard sometimes to tell them like, oh, you just need to focus on your values, right? They're going to think like, Diana, you're crazy. I need to focus on paying the bill today. <laughs> so it's, it's both things. And uh, the clients that I work with, they're all... Uh, like at least three or four, four times above the poverty level because it's just a different set of needs. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and I feel like a lot of those people never end up getting the help they need because the, the way our industry set up, normally the people that eventually speak with a financial planner, usually the relationship starts when they have money, right? A lot of firms have like very high minimums to invest. And if you don't have it, then they just turn you away, you know? Um, and I think so many people miss out on advice as a result of that model. Uh, it, it's, it's very unfortunate, you know, so I'm glad that we have people like yourself who are out there, you know, working with the people that that need it and, and uh, helping them rise above, right? And and hopefully bring that on forward to the generations to come, right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 And it's really like, um, that's why I chose the word empowerment, right? Having people feel like having them make their own decisions at the end of the day, because I'm not going to be with you whenever you're out there shopping or, or making debt payments. Like at some point, like that muscle needs to be internal. Absolutely. I like that. It, it's uh, I like the parallel to the working out kind of right muscle. And, you know, you're not going to be with your fitness trainer out there when, it, you know, so you got to make that choice. You're going to have that meal. You're going to have the big smoothie, the shake. The <laughs> it's really, it's really up to you, right? So it's just empowering yourself to, to make better choices. So Diana, this has been great. I wanted to ask you, you know, for people that would like to reach out to you, learn more about what you're doing, um, where can they find you? Or where do you live on social media and the internet in general? So I'm at, on Instagram, at all the colors. So it's all underscore the underscore colors, underscore eight. Um, you can, you can email me at Diana, Diana at all the colors.net. And yeah, that's, I mean, this is to find me, right? My website, all the colors.net Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn, Diana Giselle Yanez. Awesome. Yeah. I'll be sure to put a link to all those in the show notes for those of you that are listening. Um, let me ask you this. Let's say that, you know, somebody bumped into you in an elevator ride <laughs> for 60 seconds and you are not going to see them anymore after that. What are some things that you would like them to take away? You know, if if you only had that small time frame, like just some key nuggets that you like, hey, listen, if, if I never see you again, like, this is what I, what I would love for you to take away from, from this short elevator ride. <laughs> Yeah, this is hard for me because I told you, I like to listen to my clients for like half an hour before I say anything. I, the first thing I would be, um, I think setting up systems, setting up money systems just makes it so much easier to do your money. Like if you know how much you're putting away for retirement, for savings, for debt payoff, and then you spend the rest, you're going to be like miles ahead as if instead of like just, well, we'll see what happens each month, right? So like, kind of setting a little bit of systems, knowing your why, right? What, why are you, why are you working where you work? Why are you having the relationships that you have? Like, what is it that you want to create in your life? And focusing on relationships. You know, that's, they, they did the study at Harvard of like, they studied these people for a hundred years and the happiest people were not the ones, the ones that were wealthier, the ones that were more famous or all of those external things. It was the people who had really strong relationships. Yeah, I love that. I'm not surprised to hear that. I'm not surprised to hear that. You know, I, uh, I'm i a hip hop fan. I don't know if you are, but, you know, Biggie Smalls, right? Notorious B.I.G. He had this song, More Money, More Problems. <laughs> and uh, I remember that song came out, 
I think I think I might have been in college. And it's just so funny because I see that now that I'm a financial planner, like having more money doesn't necessarily bring more happiness to people. Um, so it's really cool how you tie in their value system and their why to that, because having money for the sake of money, it's not going to bring you happiness, right? Maybe temporarily, you know, uh, I, I hear people all the time how they're like super excited about this brand new car that they first got, right? And, and then maybe after a month, it's just a car, you know, it's like, it's no longer the same, like, wow effect. <laughs> And you also see it even with famous people, right? Like that that superstars out there, right? That have millions and millions and, and they still struggle with all kinds of stuff, even though they they have money and they have fame and everything. And so it's cool to know your why. Yeah, you want to know. And I love the, the fact that you mentioned relationships too, because uh, sometimes it could feel very lonely, uh, like you're on an island of your own. So it's very important who you choose. You know, it turns out my parents were right. You know, be careful who you hang out with, right? <laughs> because, it, you know, when I was a kid, I remember them telling me that, right? Like, be be careful who you associate yourself with. And a lot of the times I thought about it from a standpoint of, well, that can get me in trouble, right? If I'm hanging out with the kids that are up to no good. But it turns out that it's not only that, because yes, they could bring you down, but it's also... If you're selective about who you hang out with, you know, people that are reinforcing your value system that are there for you when things are not the greatest, you're also going to level up too. You know, if you're hanging out with people that are positive and doing positive things, impacting the community as well. So, uh, and you could do a lot more together too, you know, so uh, it, it's amazing the things that you realize after you're older, <laughs> that your parents are telling you a lot, right? And it's just those relationships, you know, because we're not always, I mean, the thing about going after your why, your big vision is that it, it's work, right? You have to like check in with yourself and take all these steps. And those relationships, they'll remind you of your why. They'll like be your mirror. You know, when you're feeling down, they'll be like reminding you of where you want to go and just like how far you've gone, you've come. And then you'll also get to do that for them, right? Because <laughs> there's going to be times when they're down in Europe and like, and actually giving back to other people feels so good. Like being able to have a conversation with a friend and afterwards they feel like they've got a more like kick in their step or all of that. Um, it just, it helps both of us. So yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Very Luis. true. This has been such a good conversation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. This, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time and especially uh, all the way from Ciudad de Mexico. <laughs> Uh, I look forward to seeing uh, some photos on, on your Instagram. You know, I'm sure you're going to find some really yeah, colorful definitely. stuff out there, right? <laughs> yeah, there won't be a lack of color there, that's for sure. That's true. One thing about Ciudad de Mexico, they make, they put everything inside of a bolillo, which is like a pan virote. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know chilaquiles, but chilaquiles is I do. basically like nacho. They put that inside of a bolillo, una torta de chilaquiles. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Wow. I'm so excited to try one. But I've been so, missing it's out. Just, it's crazy. It's like putting <laughs> pizza on top or like putting pasta on top of your pizza. Yeah, just, yeah. <laughs> Carb overload, but you know, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> 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 got to try it. I mean, I try anything once, you know? Yeah, I got to try it. That's, that sounds really I'm good. That sounds amazing. And everything. Awesome. Well, I hope you have a great rest of your time there. I look forward to seeing all the photos on all the colors and uh, for those listening, I'll be putting the link to Diana's website, social media, and some of the books she mentioned as well in the show notes. So thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for listening to On My Way to Wealth. If you have any questions, please send me an email at louise at onmywaytowealth.com. The information provided here is for information and education purposes only. The opinions expressed herein are solely those of myself, unless otherwise specifically cited. Material presented is believed to be from reliable sources and no representations are made by my firm or myself about other parties' information or accuracy or completeness. All information or ideas provided should be discussed in detail with a financial advisor, accountant, or legal counsel prior to implementation. <laughs>